Uh, welcome to the lecture on fundamentals of MIMO wireless communication. In the previous lecture, we have been talking about the layered view of transmitter and receiver. In that discussion, we were trying to say that if you take a look at from the channel, from the different points at the transmitter, you would see different manifestations of the link between the transmitter and the receiver. If we take a look at the picture that we had uh, drawn in the previous uh, lecture, we had drawn the schematic of the transmitter followed by the schematic of the receiver uh, with, with the channel in between. What we summarily said is that typically we would look at the channel as the RF channel for wireless communications. However, if we take a look at this section which eliminates the RF se section, we are usually looking at the analog baseband channel. If we take a look at the previous section, we are looking at the discrete samples of the channel. So, that means discrete samples go into the channel, discrete samples come out of the channel. There is a transmitter processing unit, there is a receiver processing unit. The input to this are bits, the output of these are again bits. So, if we look at this part only, what we have is the symbol mapper, also sometimes called the modulator, which send signal into a channel and channel gives output and it is the job of the D mapper to reconstruct the bits which were at the input of the symbol mapper. So, here clearly what we see inputs are constellation points. Output is something in the signal space, it can be for example, complex sequences could be any others. If we take any other stage, for example, if we are starting to look at the channel here, that means if I am taking sending signals in here and getting them out, the channel would appear as a binary channel. What we are effectively trying to say is channel depends upon from where you are seeing it and it encompasses the entire thing remaining on the right side of this particular picture. So, therefore, we can see that if we are talking about symbol mapping, the job of the symbol mapper and the D mapper simultaneously is such that it should generate signals in such a fashion, when it goes to this composite channel, this is the composite channel of the R f channel, the up conversion, the down conversion, the D 2 A converter, the A to D converter and when it comes out after going through everything over here, it should be able to reconstruct that means, the D mapper should be able to reconstruct whatever is happening here. So, this channel depends upon what we abstract, the symbol mapping and the D mapper together is designed in such a way that there is minimal distortion happening to the particular channel that which it is observing. Symbol mapping is a module of the transmitter. D mapper is the module of the receiver. So, this is usually a baseband signal processing unit and this is usually a signal generation unit. So, with this what we had uh, also summarized is that uh, when we talk about channels or the channels which you have come across uh, could be listed down as a binary channel. which you may have come across as binary symmetric channels, binary erasure channels. Uh, there could be uh, instead of binary, there could be MRE channels, it could be symmetric or asymmetric. These are usually probabilistic, probability based. and at symbol or bit level. Whereas, the next set of channels are usually the waveform channel, which takes continuous output. One such example of a famous channel is the additive 
wide Gaussian noise channel, which you have come across in studies in digital communications. Then there would be non ideal channels, as if there is a filter between the transmitter and receiver. So, here is a filter. In case of AWGN, there is addition of noise. In case of uh, non ideal, there will be some kind of a filter, for example, the telephone line. In non ideal channels, you would have time invariant which is typically in wire line communication and time variant which is the most important kind of channel in wireless communications. So, as we move ahead further in our uh, study of channels we will mostly be concentrating on time variant channels and usually these models would be uh, linear models. Typically, we say that the understanding of the channel is bread and butter for the wireless communication engineer. The reason is clearly apparent, because if we take a look at the earlier picture, especially this one, the wireless communication engineer is supposed to design individual modules at the transmitter he should be able to design individual modules at the receiver. The job of the transmitting module is to generate signals, which go through minimum distortion. The job of the receiver module is to reconstruct the signal matching as closely as possible to the input at the corresponding peer point. So, unless we understand what is happening to the signal in, in this part of the channel, be it the RF section or the analog section or the discrete analog section. Uh, we have to understand the details, then only we will be able to do a reconstruction. If we understand the details, then we can shape the signal in such a way that it undergoes minimal distortion. So, it is absolutely essential to understand the communication systems. Typically, uh, before a communication system starts getting designed, uh, the channel is usually measured and well understood. For example, if uh, somebody or if uh, when 4G was getting designed or when 3G was getting designed, one of the first things that happened was to identify the frequency of operation. Now, again as you see over here, ultimately it is the RF channel, ultimately it goes into the wireless medium. This RF, one of the most fundamental elements which design define this is the carrier frequency. And as we have said earlier, if the frequency is let us say uh, 700, 800 or 900 megahertz, this is one common frequency which we know or if we look at 30 gigahertz, the effects of the channel are different. Although we can remove the RF section in our analysis, but the corresponding effects need to be captured in the baseband channel. The effects which are at 900 megahertz are definitely different than the effects at 30 gigahertz. A model will be able to capture both provided appropriate parameters are used. And therefore, all communication system design begins with first identification of the frequency band of operation, so that the channel properties are well captured. Once the frequency band of operation is decided, then uh, the channel which lies between the transmitter and receiver is characterized. So, basically channel characterization precedes any activity on communication system. So, when we mean channel characterizations, what we mean is understanding the channel effects, what happens to the received signal when a particular kind of signal is sent from the transmitter. For example, we can study the effect on continuous wave transmission or we can also study the effect on impulse transmission, depending upon the kind of communication systems that we are uh, about to discuss. The other important thing which we should uh, note is when we talk about the channel, it depends upon what is our end goal. If we look at this part, one possible goal to design the communication system is to measure the bit error rate or to design these blocks in such a way that the bit error rate is minimized. The channel model that we produce should be able to provide sufficient details to capture the particular information that we are supposed to uh, that we are supposed to be 
using in the design of communication systems. Therefore, what we can see is the channel is uh, very, very important. It is very important to know what we are doing. It is very important to know what we are supposed to do, what exact details uh, we require from the channel model. Now, this channel modeling is a very, very important activity. We are generally not concerned with channel modeling. Most of the time in this particular course, we will be concerned with channel models. Channel modeling is an activity which precedes communication system design, which requires channel sounding by sending a particular training sequence, measuring with very specific equipments, coming up with curve fitting and various methods by which a particular model can be generated. Now, let us take a look at uh, what are the important aspects of uh, studying the channel. So, looking at the wireless channel models. Understanding the channel model is important as we have said, it is very important uh, for design of communication systems. We are interested to see what happens to the signal when it propagates to the through the particular channel. It helps us design uh, transmission signals as well as processing algorithms, which we have just explained. Also very importantly, it provides links to fundamental limits on performance. What we mean by this particular point is that, uh, when we are having a transmitter and a receiver and there is a particular channel. Let us take one example, where the transmitter and receiver is separated by a distance of uh, 10 meters. Uh, the maximum radiated power that is available is let us say uh, 0 dBm. Uh, so, we would like to understand uh, what is the maximum bit rate that can be achieved for this particular system, if the bandwidth is limited to a few megahertz. If we take the same example and refine it further, say our operating environment is the indoor condition as case 1 and the another our operating environment is outdoor uh, in a rich scattering environment or let us say in a city center region or if we take another region, let us say the, the rural scenario. In all these three cases, although parameters are different, the operating environment are different and we would expect the performance limit to be different in each of the cases. Now, if we add additional thing, for instance mobility, if we say the transmitter and receiver are having relative motion and there is a certain maximum speed between the transmitter and receiver, again that would influence the maximum bit rate that is achievable uh, in these uh, conditions. Very important thing about wireless communication system is the channel is random in nature, we will see, see why it is and the variation of uh, received signal or the received signal strength is across the time domain, we have already said there is time varying channel. The received signal strength varies across frequency. For instance, I am interested in a 900 megahertz band, little bit to the left of 900 megahertz band and a little bit to the right of 900 megahertz, the signal amplitude or signal strength is going to be different. Similarly, space is another important dimension and for us in this particular course, space is one of the most important dimensions that we will consider. Of course, time and frequency are definitely taken into account. So, by space dimension, what we mean is if I am receiving a signal at a certain distance from the transmitter, uh, let us say 10 dBm or, or 10 dB of SNR and I move to a, another location on the x y plane, it could be moving closer to the transmitter or far away from the transmitter or even the distance remaining the same, we have changed the angle such that the radial distance from the transmitter and the receiver remain the same. What we expect is that the average received signal strength could be different, simply because the paths of signal which propagate from the transmitter to the receiver could be undergoing different reflection, refraction or scattering phenomena. There could be line of sight, there could be severely obstructed situations. So, these will decide the kinds of effect that the signal undergoes. Now, when we talk about the channel, what we would be interested in is channel models. We will not be generating the models, but we will not be using the exact channel properties, but finally we will be using models. You have been using models in many studies. Now, as the name suggests, it is finally a model. A model means it is an abstraction of the exact phenomenon that happens. For instance, again if we go back to this particular picture, the same channel is present over here. It depends upon what 
we are interested in accordingly the channel is modeled differently. So, although it is the same effect it manifests itself at different locations in different ways. So, therefore, uh, we are uh, we should remember that we are end of the day using models and not the exact channels. Now, why we need models? Because uh, many a times the systems are very very complex and it is not possible uh, to get closed form expression. Uh, it may not be possible uh, to do even trials. For example, if I am designing a communication system, I would like to build a transmitter, I have to build a receiver, go and do field trials, see what is the performance, come back to the lab, design the transmitter again, design the receiver again and do it. It is hugely time consuming, it is very very complex. So, in order to avoid that, we would like to use models, so that while sitting in the lab or sitting in our rooms or in our office, we are able to design transmitter and receiver components. And uh, many a times one has to resort uh, to simulations, uh, we will see certain simulation uh, things while we do in the course. By simulation means we imu imitate the effect that happens at the transmitter or at the receiver and what happens in the channel. So, once we send uh, the signal that goes out, we, m we imp model the impact of the channel and finally receive it, we can do all these things using a digital computer or a specialized equipment. So, we do not have to go to the real field to the actual operation, we can do it right sitting in our labs. It is one of the most, uh, I, I think it is one of the difficult parts of studying wireless communications and this is where we begin with. So, one of the messages which I would like to put forward is those who are aspiring to pursue this uh, domain of wireless communications. It is very, very important to understand the propagation effects and the channel models. At least if you understand one particular channel model, you get an idea of how other channels are going to be and there will be variations about of the similar kind of models that you are going to encounter. Models can be deterministic, deterministic, they can be statistical. Uh, deterministic we mean uh, we solve E m equations uh, for every surface that uh, the wave hits, whether it gets refracted, reflected or diffracted or even scattering and we account for the cumulative effect of these phenomena at the receiver, which could give rise to fluctuation of signal strength across time frequency and space. These models are uh, very, very complex in nature. Uh, it requires huge amount of signal processing. There are many, many tools available uh, for deterministic uh, channel models. Uh, one of them could be like uh, ray tracing. However, in, in the methods which we use uh, for especially baseband signal design, we generally refer to statistical models. These statistical models, uh, what they mean is there is a model with parameters and if you use the models, it adheres to certain statistical measure. For example, the mean, the variance, the distribution or the coherence factors. So, when uh, the model when iterated or tried over several, several iterations, for example, millions or ten thousands of iterations, the statistical properties remain the same and these are random in nature. However, again in statistical models, there could be analytical models, there could be empirical models. In empirical models, what we have is uh, channels are measured from measurement curve fitting way or in some other way uh, models are, in, are uh, developed, which has the same statistical parameters as that of the measured uh, channel parameters. End of the day, we need uh, very simple tools, uh, which we can use with pen and paper or in a computer, so that we can design communication systems. Uh, in this course, we will be encountering uh, statistical uh, channel models and mostly analytical. Of course, we will uh, look at some of the empirical models, especially for large scale feeding. The factors which influence uh, the channel are the propagation factors, which are basically reflection, diffraction and scattering, which we have been mentioning. Uh, we divide the study of channel into two broad categories, large scale fading and, and uh, small scale fading. The large scale fading are those effects or those models, which capture uh, the effect of uh, signal fluctuation over large separation distances between the transmitter and the receiver. Whereas, small scale fading are those models, which capture the effect of uh, signal propagation or signal strength fluctuation across small separations. If we consider this particular diagram as uh, shown in this particular slide, let us imagine that there is a transmitter, uh, which sends out signals. Now, when these E m waves propagate, 
we will assume of course, the transmitter and the receiver are in the far field, they are not in the near field region. The signals propagate, they can hit a building surface, they can come to the receiver. There could be a direct line of sight, there could be reflection from a moving object. So, there could be multitudes of things that happen to the signal. So, when they come to the receiver, they combine together to give a combined effect at the, at the receiver. As a result of which, uh, there could be signal strength fluctuations. So, when we study small scale fading, we actually take into account the so called multipath propagation. The name explains the propagation from the transmitter to the receiver happens through multiple path. That could be first path, this could be the second path, this could be the third path and so on. Theoretically, there could be infinite number of paths, but on all practical purposes, we generally model them with finite number of paths and that is usually dependent upon the resolution of the instruments that we which we use to measure the channel characteristics. The large scale fading is usually dealing with uh, the average signal strength whereas, the small scale fading is usually uh, to provide models which predict instantaneous signal strength fluctuations. There is also the effect of mobility, because of uh, moving uh, objects between the path of transmitter and receiver, which result in Doppler shift, we will see in details. And this causes time selectivity of the signal, that means signals uh, fluctuate in signal strength even though the receiver may be static at one point. The receiver could be moving that could be one case, the other case the receiver and the transmitter is fixed, but there are moving objects which reflect, refract or diffract the signals which finally, come to the receiver. Because of this there are time variations of the signals that are arriving at the receiver. One thing we can grossly remember is that small scale fading phenomenon or this particular model captures instantaneous variation of signal strength in the range of 30 to 40 dB typically. It is not the final number, but that is usually the range of fluctuation of signal strength at the receiver even though it is located at a fixed particular point. When we study uh, wireless communications uh, or the channel models, uh, the, the wireless channel uh, fading effects that is the fluctuation of signal strength over time. Uh, can be broadly categorized into small scale fading and large scale fading as uh, mentioned in the previous slide. The large scale fading can be separated into two different models, there is the path loss model and the shadowing model, which we will see in subsequent lectures. The path loss model is also sometimes known as the attenuation model, which describes the loss of signal strength due to separation of path length between the transmitter and receiver. The shadowing on the other hand uh, captures the effect of local fluctuation of average SNR and improves upon the details of which is captured by the path loss model. Both give the, uh, the prediction of average received signal strength. If we look at small scale fading, the small scale fading can be classified as time selective fading, space selective fading and frequency selective fading. Time selective fading as the name suggests, there is selectivity that means selection and the selection across the time axis. So, if we have time axis and if we have the received signal strength on this axis, across time if the signal strength is very low, the channel is not allowing signals to go through. Across time, if the signal strength is very high, the channel would allow signals to go through unattenuated. So, what we usually would see if I draw P received, received power at a particular distance as a function of time and measure it in let us say dBm, uh, we might see these kind of figures where these like random fluctuations in time and these fluctuations would in the be in the range of 30 to 40 dB. We call it time selective, because across time there is selections in time windows, where the signal passes through without much attenuation and there are sections in the time window, where there is huge amount of attenuation of the signal strength at the receiver. 
One typical example that I can point at this uh, particular instance is if you uh, ever listen to uh, amplitude modulation radio, let us say the uh, medium wave or the short wave transmission. If you tune to a particular station, you would often find fluctuating signal intensity and that is uh, one uh, representation of uh, fading. Uh, one thing I would like to remind again uh, in this particular subject uh, or the things that we deal, deal with, it is very difficult to obtain uh, situations where we can perceive the effects instantaneously. So, it is a bit imaginative, we have to extend our imaginations a little bit and that is why I mentioned uh, simulations is one way of getting closer and moving beyond imagination towards uh, practical systems. The next uh, dimension is the space dimension. Uh, in the space dimensions, uh, it can be rich scattering or poor scattering. In, in the uh, frequency uh, dimension, it could be frequency selective or fast or, or, or uh, flat fading and the time dimension, it could be fast fading and slow fading. We will discuss the details of fast fading and slow fading when we talk about small scale fading. We will talk about details of frequency selective and flat fading when we talk about more details about small scale fading. About space selectivity, I uh, will briefly tell you now and we will take up in details. We have rich scattering and poor scattering environment. A rich scattering environment would be one, where there is lot of reflections from the surroundings. So, if we consider this particular room uh, or the room where you are sitting, there are lot of walls. So, if there is a generation of a signal uh, from the transmitter, there are reflectors all around and there is a receiver let us say there could be one direct line of sight path, there could be reflected path 1, there could be reflected path 2, there could be reflected path 3, there could be multiple reflections and so on. So, this is a rich scattering environment. Whereas, if we have the transmitter and it is a rural region where there is not much obstruction available and there is a receiver and uh, there could be one hillock probably a hill at some point it could be mostly line of sight and maybe one reflected path coming to it. So, this would be a poor scattering environment, this would be a rich scattering environment. So, we will have to understand what goes on in these uh, particular channel models, so that we are able to capture the effect of the channel. Before we close uh, today's lecture, I would like to explain this particular figure. Uh, this is available in the book by Rappaport. So, uh, in that figure, it is shown that the separation between the transmitter and receiver in the x axis represented in meters and the y axis it is the received power in dBm. What you see is the green lines fluctuating to a large extent is representation of the instantaneous variation of the signal strength or it can be called the small scale fading. Because over small scale, this is a small scale within a meter which is within a few lambda or a fraction of a lambda or the wavelength, there is huge fluctuation of signal strength. You can clearly see it goes down to nearly minus 70 dB from around minus 37 dB or so. So, there is around uh, more than 30 dB of fluctuation in this particular snapshot. Whereas, if we start taking the average of these uh, instantaneous fluctuations in this range, what we get is the red line. So, if we are interested in the average uh, or the model which predicts this average signal strength fluctuation are captured under the large scale fading models. Whereas, uh, the small scale fading model captures these small fluctuations. So, under large scale fading uh, what we have is the average fluctuation. So, this in term predicts the average signal strength this is talking about the instantaneous right so we will look at uh, some details of large scale fading models which help us predict the received signal strength uh, as a function of transmitter receiver separation distance across large distances. For instance, when the transmitter receiver separation distance increases by orders of hundreds of meters or by orders of a few kilometers. 
whereas when we will be interested in studying the effect of signal strength fluctuation when the transmitter receiver separation is in the order of lambda let us say a few centimeters or a few meters uh, then we will be resorting to the small scale fading models. In the next few lectures we will start uh, briefly taking a look at large scale fading models before delving into details of small scale fading models. When we are concerned with the transmitter and receiver design, uh, we would be mainly interested in the small scale fading model. For the sake of completeness, we will briefly take a look at large scale fading model and just uh, let me remind you uh, our objective is to look at large scale fading model for the sake of completeness, but what we will be mostly needing in this particular course is the small scale fading models. The reference uh, books that you can follow for the future lectures, uh, future few lectures would be wireless communications by Rappaport, uh, mobile principles of mobile communication by Gordon Stuber, uh, wireless communication by Andrea Goldsmith and many others. So, I would again uh, request you to keep the references handy. Uh, of course, we will provide you with uh, sufficient details uh, in this and uh, we may be able to provide you with uh, some of the slides, but always uh, reading such references would refine and provide more clarity into the details. Because again I iterate uh, this is one of uh, the critical parts of communication and uh, success in this course would depend primarily on understanding the details uh, of these models or what is the abstraction that is being done in this model. Uh, because the rest of the details of MIMO communications would be using these models which we will not refer to in any further details once we cross over the section on this propagation effects of uh, the wireless communication links. Thanks. Thank you.